So today we're going to talk about loneliness with um, one of our viewers. So someone from our community uh, is going to come on and we're going to just talk a little bit about loneliness. If you guys are suffering from loneliness or being stuck or video game uh, addiction or motivation or other um, issues that are kind of keeping you from moving forward in life, unable to find your purpose, things like that, go ahead and check out our coaching program. Um, and, you know, I think uh, group coaching is a great way to sort of address loneliness and sort of meet other people. Um, one thing to know about group coaching is it's not really about making friends. It's about sort of forming really authentic bonds with people that you guys can like work on your issues with, um, work through your challenges kind of together. But if you guys are looking to party up and, and work on being stuck in life, definitely check out the coaching program. Hey, man. Thanks for coming on. Hey, no worries, man. So, uh, and what am I calling you? Uh, you can call me Nicholas or Nick, whatever you prefer. Okay. So, Nicholas. Um, yeah. And so, tell, so we're talking about loneliness today? Um, yeah, well, mostly uh, emotional loneliness, not like a physical point of it. Okay. So let's start there. What's the difference between physical loneliness and emotional loneliness? Um, well, to me, it's, um, well, you can have friends physically and hang out with them, but you can still not feel the connection always. So then you emotionally feel lonely because you don't have anyone to maybe uh, talk to and really let out with, if that makes sense to you. Huh. So yeah, okay. you, you get emotionally isolated at that point is what I feel like. Okay, so can you tell us what that feels like? Um, to me, it feels a lot like, uh, well, you feel lonely, of course. You feel oh. like you can't rely on anyone and you don't really feel understood on okay. a lot of points as a person. So you feel um, lonely and like you can't be understood. Yes, that's part of it. Um, it's a lot to do with the fact that you don't, yeah, it's mainly on just like being understood by people on a on an emotional level, like on a deeper level, I guess you could say. So, so you, it's it sounds like you actually have kind of people around you. You have friends, but you feel misunderstood. Yeah, definitely. I don't. I don't feel like um, cl like really, really close, with ex an exception of like a few people. But I have a lot of friends that I don't have like an actual connection with. If that makes sense. Okay. So it's like. I don't feel like I can rely on a lot of them on a deeper level. Okay, but it sounds like you do have a few people that you sort of rely on or can rely on on a deeper level. Yeah, more or less. I don't really, I don't really talk to them on a deeper le level a lot. Um, a lot of it is m me myself in my own room, feeling myself being lonely. If that makes sense. Hmm. Um, and then um, to kind of explain it better, it has like two parts of it. It has the part where I feel like I can't connect with a lot of people, but I also have like, I don't want to call it anxiety, but I wanna, I'm i like scared, right? So I'm scared of being alone later in life or being like forever alone, if that makes sense. So it's like those sure. two combinations. So, so you're scared of being alone. And what's the second piece? Um, no, the, the first piece is that I'm currently feeling like emotionally alone, um, which I tried to explain earlier. Yeah. And then the second piece is kind of me being scared for the future that I won't have people uh, to be with, both like platonically and romantically. Okay. Um, have you been in a romantic relationship before? Yep. That's been around four years ago. Okay. And do you mind if I ask how old you are? Yeah, I'm 20. You're 20. Okay. Yeah. And how long have you been feeling emotionally lonely? For around three years, maybe. Okay. And do you remember what you felt like in your late teens? Like what, what changed? Um, well, now it's something I have accepted. It's like a part of me now. So it's not something I'm bothering to bother too much by. Um, but you've accepted but that you're going to be lonely. No, I'm, I'm accepted. It's the feeling I have. Uh, okay. It's not like, you know, yeah. yeah. So basically during high school, I, uh, I was bothered, 
bothered a lot by the fact that I felt lonely and that my peers seemed way more popular than me in all aspects, um, which gave me insecurities. And then uh, I went to a therapist, like school therapist, and she kind of changed my outlook on stuff by saying it's all about the attitude when you go to like parties, et cetera, right? Um, so she tried to instill in me that if you come in with a good ad attitude compared to the bad one, you'll have more success in finding friends and so on. Um, which, you know, did work in finding friends, but it doesn't really work for me on an emotional level, if that makes sense. Which is sure, so still feeling it. Yeah, interesting. Can I think for a second, Nicholas? Sure. Okay. Give me just another second, okay? Yeah, no worries. Take your time. Let me ask you something. Did your feeling of emotional loneliness get worse the better you got at changing your attitude? Yes. The um, What I call anxiety or whatever it is got worse. So whenever I had um, an episode of feeling extra lonely and started spiraling in my thoughts, that would get worse. A lot worse, basically. What would get a lot worse? Um, The amount of times I would feel the, like the feelings and the thoughts would come up uh came more often and it would like be there for longer like the episode and so, that it, that happened more the more you learned to change your attitude in social situations yeah definitely okay so let's let's just notice that for a second because that sounds i mean it makes perfect sense to me but it sounds strange Right. So like right. here you're seeing a therapist and your therapist is telling you, hey, if you're like insecure about going to parties, what you can do is change your attitude and then you can like learn to be like more friendly and more positive. And as you become more friendly and positive, you'll be able to make more friends and you'll be able to go to parties. Is that a fair? Mm, mm, no, I would okay. say the way she wanted me to think about it is that. If you change, so um, she had to think about self-fulfilling uh, prophecies, right? So if I came in there thinking, oh, um, nobody would like me or nobody cares about me or whatever, she would say that would, you know, rub off to people compared to if I came in being like, hey, let's meet new people, let's make friends. So she was saying, she was basically saying, if I went to the party with a more positive attitude, um, I wouldn't feel uh, as judged or whatever you could call it. Okay. And and that worked. Yes. For a while it did. Uh I got more friends. I was more confident, or well, I am more confident confident about going to parties. But I also feel more disconnected to a lot of people. Okay. Right. So let's so this is gonna sound kind of strange, Nicholas. Oh well, let me ask you, Nicholas, what do you think is how do you understand that? Do you have any ideas as to what's going on? Um, kind of. I mean, to me, I think it's because most of the relationships are kind of superficial. Um, and why are they superficial? What makes them superficial? Um, I'll say it's due to the fact that we are only connected by other friends and we don't actually like hang out and meet and interact. You know what I mean? So we only hang out superficially whenever there's a reason to do it. We don't okay. really support each other like with feelings and whatnot because we don't talk about it that much at least. Um, so I feel like that's the main thing because we don't really like support each other in that fact. Oh, that's what that's... keeps you from talking about your feelings? Um, I have a strong feeling of independence and not really relying on each other or other people. I would so... say anyway. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a theme for today. Right? Mm -hmm. It's how the solutions are the problems. That's our theme for today. Sure. Um, so I'm going to try to explain this concept for a second, and then we're going to see if how much of it applies and how much of it doesn't. Okay. Okay. So, if we think about people who have problems in their relationships... They tend to hold on to old solutions that used to work. So one of my uh, teachers once told me that the process of growing up 
is about getting rid of what works, which is kind of a weird way to think about it. But like, let's say I'm a two-year-old kid and I don't get what I want and then I start crying and then maybe I'll get what I want. Right. Sure. So like, like two year olds mm -hmm. have certain ways to make their needs known and get what they are looking for and get their meet needs met. As we grow older, ideally a two year old will like abandon some of those things because even though it used to work, it's sort of not working anymore. But even like a 13 year old who throws a temper tantrum, depending on the circumstances that they grow up in, will actually get that their needs met through a temper tantrum. And they're also 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds for whom, like, throwing temper tantrums is a way to get their needs met. And if they end up, like, let's say you're 25 years old and you're used to throwing temper tantrums because your parents sort of tolerated that kind of thing, and then you start engaging in a romantic relationship and you start throwing temper tantrums, and depending on who you're dating, they'll either tolerate that or they'll break up with you. And when a lot of people break up with you, that becomes sort of a relationship problem, right? Like it's, there's some problem mm -hmm. that you have with relationships. And what I find time and again is that, first of all, I start with the assumption that like people aren't stupid. I also start with the assumption that people aren't like broken in some way. I think for the most part, most people out there like have brains and bodies and minds that are functioning the best way that they know how. Right? If you think about like, you know, your body, like, most people's hands work pretty well. Most people's eyes work pretty well. This is a really crazy thing. Most people's minds work pretty well. They do exactly what they're designed to do, or they do, know, do the best that they know how. So what I'm noticing, any questions about that? No, that makes sense. Okay. So it's kind of weird, right? Because you went to this therapist and your therapist like taught you this like positive mental attitude strategy. And what we're hearing is actually a lot of success. We're hearing that you were able to go to parties that you were able to make friends, that you changed your attitude and you feel confident and comfortable interacting with other people. Whereas in high school, you didn't really feel that way. So that's a success, right? Right. Yeah. And at the <clears throat> same time, I asked you kind of a weird question, because if this is a success, I asked you the question, have you found that the better you got at this, the more emotionally isolated you feel? And your answer was what? Um, yeah. Yeah. Correct. So, like, let's try yeah. to think about how does that happen? Like, what's going on there? So, my sense is that this worked for you, but what you learned how to do was, like, put on a certain kind of clothing. Like, you put on this mental clothing of, like, I'm going to have a positive mental attitude. And then you started to be someone that you're not exactly. Like, you started to take parts of yourself. Like, you had these insecurities, right? And then what you did is mm -hmm. you like buried those insecurities underneath this like positive mental attitude. And as a result, the most connected that someone can get to you is halfway. Because the most they yeah. ever see is like the positive part. And then what you're here, what I'm hearing from you is that like you, you, you don't have a deeper emotional connection with people. And that's sort of because, like, I think you approach it from sort of a, hey, let's, like, hang out and, like, let's meet people and let's have a good time. And so yeah. you project that side of yourself, which is a good side, and people kind of like that. And they're like, hey, like, Nicholas is a pretty cool guy. But it never gets to something serious because all the serious stuff has been kind of pushed away. What do you think? I can definitely agree with that. Um, mainly to do with all of my good friends that I do rely on every now and then uh, from, you know, before high school mainly. So, you know, back from when I was 14 and 10 and under, stuff like that. So, so, so who, can, yeah. So let's think oh. about who did they get to know? Um, well, yeah, definitely the more uh, connected or like true part of myself, I guess you could call it. I just know actual true part of oneself, but you know. The, Why not? The, what does that mean? Well, um, I just have to think that you always project one side of you to everyone. You don't always project like, the whole side of yourself to no matter who you're with i feel like yeah. just um because you know like when when as you talked about the mask thing when you go to like a sports club or whatever you put on one side of yourself when you go to a class you put on another side so on and so forth um so i feel like with my older friends they definitely got to know me better uh on a more all-around standpoint but i don't think there's anyone that like really 
you know, know the full me, not even myself. So do you want them to know the full you? Um, no. Why not? I don't think so. Because I think there's some things I want to keep private for myself. Um, just for the fact that there's some things I feel like that, that shouldn't be shared to other people. Um, what doesn't have to be anything sensitive. Just um, it could be hobbies. It could be um, just your alone time in general, honestly. It could be your own little secrets or promises to yourself. But I think it, it depends from person to person. I mean, so I, I totally get that things are personal. Right. I'm still a little bit curious about, it seems like you feel like they shouldn't be shared. Mm, no, I'm not saying that necessarily. What are you it's saying? It's just my, um, I'm just saying me personally would rather not share everything. Sure. Some things I would just want to keep, yeah. And are there things that you want to share, but you haven't been able to? Definitely, yeah. Um, like now, like the emotional and and every time I've, I've felt depressed, like in previous times in high school, uh, I couldn't, for example, always talk to my parents because I wasn't comfortable with it. Um, okay. Stuff like that, you know. So you weren't comfortable with it. What does that mean? Um, the reason why I wasn't comfortable with it is due to my mother being very, uh, like she blames herself a lot for a lot of things. So I felt like if I told her, she would be upset about it um so that's the reason and also just the fact that i wasn't comfortable sharing things about myself in general at that point in time i was very like isolated so so nicholas like those two combinations what are you afraid is going to happen if people see who you are mm, i'm afraid that people will leave like for good physically and emotionally has that happened to you before? Yes. A long time ago, though. I was uh, 14, I believe, where I had like a lot of friends that would just, from my knowledge, randomly leave without any actual reason. And what's, can you tell us about that? Um, so I had a combination of uh, online friends and real life friends that sometimes would just like cut me off and just stop talking from that point. Um, which seemed to me at that point that we were in good terms, so it didn't really make sense to me. Um, so that's where, like, basically a lot of it stems from, I think. I um, think so, too. Yeah. So I, I feel like a lot of it, at least afterwards at that point, which I do know is that uh, I, I shut myself in and didn't trust a lot of people. Um, and then it kind of kind of came over it and started trusting people again and talking to people, but I never really you know, fully open myself up anymore afterwards. I think you started talking to people again. I don't think you started trusting people. Right. What, can you tell us, uh, can you tell us a story about when you were 14? Like, give us an example. Like, help me understand what that, what happened. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to, to, I mean, not to talk about, but to explain. Um, Basically, so I, I had a few friends that I talked to almost every day. Um, and I don't know, there's not much to talk about except for the fact that I was just cut off completely one day. From so, all of them know, or one of them? No, it's just a few of them. Like a few of my friends uh, over a period of time, I think it's around like half a year, just like disappeared. Um, and they didn't really know each other. So I'm not sure how like it happened. But just um, some important people left me like after each other basically and in how did they how did they cut you off like like how did um, that happen like the you know they uh blocked me on social media they didn't reply to messages they stopped hanging out with me that in that sense interesting so these are real yeah. life friends let's like just uh, just both both a real life person and a few online yeah can, can we just pick one and kind of go through the sequence of events um sure i'm trying to feel like uh i'm trying to find if there's any theme um so what don't, happens is that huh Sorry? nicholas I, I i don't want a theme and i don't want a conclusion i want right. as raw of a da data as you can provide so as unfiltered as you can give me like tell me 
you know, think about like, just like pick one person. And then you kind of said they blocked you on social media and stuff like that. So were these people that you knew at school? Um, no, mostly online friends. Some of them I met later on though, but mostly online okay. friends so that I came to know. Online yeah. friends. And like, how did you know them online? Did you guys play games together? Like, what was the deal? Some of them I played games with, uh, and others I just met on this, uh, social media app called Meowchat, which is not, you know, available anymore. Okay. Um, server shut down or something. I'm not sure about anyways. Uh, it's like basically an app like Discord, but you can meet random, random people. Online. Okay. Um, some of them I have met later. One of them became my girlfriend afterwards. Um, not my current girlfriend, but like at the time. Um, and yeah, so we I talked to them there, and then a lot of them they didn't know each other. A lot of them started coming me off after like half a year. I think it was half a year, year's time. Um, and one of them also, like basically one of them staged that they couldn't use the phone. And then I found out they had the phone later on to, you know, chat on. And then, you know, I was blocked later. How did you find so, that out? Uh, they had an alternate account. So. And how did you feel when you found out they were lying to you? Uh, I felt betrayed, to put it simple, <laughs> pretty much, yeah. What do you mean by betrayed? Um, like they, they betrayed my trust basically and, uh, the friendship we had at the time. How did they betray it? Um, well, like you said, lying to me, uh, by trying to get out of the relationship we had, like the the friendship, um, without an actual reason, without telling me why or what's going on or anything like no communication whatsoever. Um, so I think that is what kind of shocking so i'm i'm envisioning that you sort of started to be afraid that there's something wrong with you right yeah i guess you could say that what do you that is um sorry go ahead um no um one of the themes i have when i when i get these episodes of feeling uh lonely and afraid is that i feel like something's wrong with me but i quite can't uh figure out what it is if that makes sense where does your mind go yeah go ahead um, it goes in a spiral, but it usually goes towards the direction where I feel like I don't deserve a lot of friends and relationships. It's where it tends to go towards. Can I think for a second? Sure. Do you have a sense of, of why it is that, let's assume for a moment that that's true, that you don't deserve a lot of friends. What do you think it is that makes you not deserve a lot of friends? Mm, that's what I never can't figure out. Um, so that's why I call it like an anxiety, even though it's not you know diagnosed, because mm-hmm. none of the thoughts I get make sense whatsoever. Like there's no logic in them. Um, okay. So I, I, I just spiral towards it and I can't figure out why that would be the case. I'm just looking at trends in the fact that, you know, um, my friends seem to be more popular and I lost friends and stuff like that, if that makes sense. So I, I want to ask you something, Nicholas, or I'm going to make an observation, actually. Sure. So I want you to notice that a lot of times when we have a feeling, our mind tries to come up with reasons which is what it's supposed to do. So let's say that I'm walking barefoot and I feel something poke my foot. So what do I do? I I notice that sensation. I have a feeling of stepping on something sharp. And then I lift up my foot and I look at my foot and I look at the ground. Does that make sense? I look for a reason why I feel a certain way. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense, yeah. So like, let's say I'm in a relationship and I have a feeling that my partner is cheating on me. Then what I do is I go look for reasons. I start checking their phone. I start texting them. I start asking around. I look for a reason to explain a feeling. Mm -hmm. And what I'm hearing from you is that you have a feeling. And 
you have a feeling, but you haven't been able to find a reason. Definitely, yeah. And you're still that looking for one. Case. Yes. What do you think about that? Mm. That is, I, I don't know. I, I can't collect my thoughts on exactly that. I feel uh, anything, if anything, I feel scared. Um, yep. Yeah. So, so I think the more you look for a reason and the more you're unable to find one, what does that do to your fear? Uh, accelerates it, I would say. I Absolutely, like right? Yeah. Because you're like, oh my mm -hmm. God, there's something wrong and I can't find it. And it's big and it's bad. And I'm looking and I'm looking and I'm looking and I can't find it. And if I can't find it, I can't fix it. And if I can't fix it, I'm going to be alone. Because yeah. whatever it is, is going to pop up again and it's going to drive people away. Yes, that would be the case. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Do you think that kind of encapsulates how you feel? Uh, yeah, actually, I would say it is. Um, yeah, because that, that would count both platonically and romantically. Yeah. Okay. So I want to talk to you for a second about something called psychosis. Okay. And I realize this is kind of weird. I'm not trying to judge you yeah. or anything. <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah no but worries. have you heard this term psychosis? I have, but I'm not quite sure of the definition of it. Okay. So, like, do you know what the word paranoia means? Yeah. Okay. So, I don't think you're psychotic. I don't think you're paranoid or anything like that. The, the reason I'm bringing it up is because sometimes if we want to try to understand how something works, we have to look at a malfunction of that object. So, for example, if I'm trying to figure out what a tire does on a car, if I slash the tire and let the air out, then I quickly figure out, oh, this is the function of the tire. Does that make sense? If we break yeah. like some piece, like if I unplug my mouse, like if I don't know what controls my computer and then I unplug my mouse, I can quickly figure out, okay, the keyboard controls this and the mouse controls this. Does that make sense? So we sure. can discover the function of something by looking at a case of malfunction. With me? Yeah. So I want to use psychosis to illustrate a general principle of the mind that applies to everyone. But when we look at psychosis, we'll kind of see how that function of the mind works because we'll look at like a, a version that's kind of busted. So sometimes okay. people have um, paranoia and it's sort of like an, it's like a illness or like it's, it's a malfunction of paranoia. So what happens is that, you know, sometimes people with psychosis, they'll wake up one day and they feel like they're being watched. They have a feeling I'm being watched in the same way that you have a feeling that something is wrong with you. You just wake mm -hmm. up one day and you've like, I've got, I'm a feeling, I have a feeling that something's being watched. Right. So then what happens is their logical mind starts to try to figure things out. Like, okay, where, like who's watching me? And they look around and they're like, oh, well, I have like these two webcams here. And so like, that must be what's watching me. So what they do is they unplug their webcams and then they like feel better for a day. And then they wake up the next day and they're like, okay, I feel like I'm being watched. Like I took care of the webcams. Like what else is going on? Oh, must be someone. Maybe someone's looking at me through the windows. So then what they do is they like, they close up all the windows and then they're like, feel better for a day. And the next day they wake up and they're like, I feel like I'm being watched. And they're like, not really sure what's going on. So then they walk down the street and sure enough, there's someone looking at them. They're walking down the street and there's someone walking the other way. And like that person's kind of watching. And then they go and they're, they drive around and they see like there are cars, like they make a right turn and someone else makes a right turn. And they're like, oh my God, maybe I'm being followed. And this goes on for a while. And then like they, they try to figure out, okay, where is this feeling coming from? Who's watching me? And then eventually, like, they start to construct, like, really bizarre theories. So they start to think that, like, it must be the government or the mafia because they think, who has the resources to be constantly watching me? And the best answer that they can come up with is, like, a powerful organization. But what I want to point out is, like, you know, which comes first, the thought or the feeling? The feeling. And the thought is always looking for an answer. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
And so the, the really interesting thing is that's the way our mind is wired, though. Because like when we step on something, we have a feeling. And then our mind has evolved to be like, hey, let's try to figure out where this feeling comes from. Like, that's what our mind does. It's like it tries to explain our feelings because our feelings tend to be like, you know, intuitive, like warning signs or like, I mean, there's a lot of important stuff in feelings. If I walk into a room and I make eye contact with someone and then I have butterflies in my stomach and I start to feel sweaty and I start giggling like an idiot, like th those feelings are telling me something, right? So mm. feelings are a really important source of information. And then my mind tries to like piece together what's going on with the feeling. Any no. questions so far? No, that makes sense. What makes sense about it? Um, the fact that we are, you know, we've evolved to perceive stuff and then make sense of it, right? So we're using our senses. Yep. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is that feelings come first. Definitely. Right. And, and so like, you know, you can walk into... Um, you know, you can walk into your house late at night and then like you get this feeling that maybe you're in danger and all the lights are off. And like that feeling comes from somewhere and then you try to reassure it, you turn on the lights, you look around, whatever. So in your case, I think what could be going on is that you have a feeling that something in you is busted. And that's not an inaccurate feeling because how else do you explain these people ghosting you? Like there yeah. must be something wrong, right? But I, I think what started to happen is that feeling has started to grow so much and develop a life of its own that your mind is doing all of these compensatory mechanisms. It's like starting to think about this and think about this and think about this. And you can never find the answer for what's wrong with you because I don't think there's anything wrong with you. Mm. I think the reason that you feel like something is wrong with you is because people did treated you in a way that made you feel not valued. I but the thing is, that feeling doesn't come from the outside. It comes from their actions towards you. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. So like, let, let me give oh, you just yeah. another example. So let's say I have abusive parents. If my parents treat me like shit, I'm going to go through life feeling like I'm worth nothing. It doesn't actually mean I'm worth nothing. It just means that the way that my parents treated me made me feel like I'm worth nothing. And then as I go through life with that feeling, I'm going to come up with all kinds of compensatory mechanisms or solutions to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Like I need to ask people all the time. Like I have, I have to ask them, like if I'm dating someone, I have to ask them every single day, do you love me? Sure. Because I need to hear it from them because I don't believe it about yeah. myself. So I need reassurance. Do you love me? Do you really love me? Do you really, really, really? Are you going to leave me? Promise you me. Promise me you'll never leave. Promise me. Because I don't have faith or confidence that this person wouldn't want to leave me. And so you, your mind comes up with all these things to try to account for it. But at the end of the day, like, where does that pe person's lack of confidence come from? Well, that would come from themselves. Absolutely. Yes. Right. Yeah. Do you think this applies to your situation? Yeah. I would say, yeah. How so? I would say so. Um, Could, maybe would say it does, maybe it doesn't. In, I would say in a different way. But it applies more to the fact that I um, keep telling myself that I'm going to be lonely whenever, you know, these thoughts come up. And I just, um, I can't stop that feeling of thought from coming. And then in that sense, as you said earlier, I, I take the logic to the fact that there might be something wrong with me, even though it's not an actual fact. Um so I think in that way it would apply, but, you know. Yeah, so now we get to an interesting, uh, great point. So let me ask you, when you feel like you're going to be lonely, what do you try to do with that feeling? Um, whenever that happens, I don't really do much about it. I tend to isolate myself and just be in my feels for the next two hours, three hours. And then after that, I just kind of, Get numb, if that makes sense. Okay, that does make sense. Yeah. So I think you you kind of get like mentally exhausted from the feeling. That, yeah, I would say that. Yeah. Yep. Right. So it's like kind of like kind of, an overload. Yep, an overload, yeah. and then it's like you know it's like a you know what a blue screen of death is a BSOD. 
Um, no. Okay, so it's like when your computer crashes, your RAM overloads or something, and then right. it just restarts, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So like that's that I'm hearing that happen with you. So let's think a little bit about. Do you have any idea about how to move forward from here? Um, I feel like it's a lot to do with um accepting myself, but. I'm not sure how to do that. that <laughs> right? So this yeah. is the problem because it's like, yeah. everyone's like, accept yourself, Nicholas, for who you are. Yeah, yeah. And then you'll be Definitely, free. Yeah. And then you're like, how the fuck do I do that? I, yeah, you know, it, it makes no sense. From It's basically Just, like it, telling depressed people not to be depressed, you know? like if No, it's actually the opposite. That's why that's why they, they have trouble with it. Because it's not telling them to not be depressed. It's telling them to be depressed. I'm not quite sure what you mean. So accepting because yourself you know, is not if a de- so if we, if there's someone who's depressed and we tell them to accept themselves, are we telling them to be depressed or not be depressed? No, that's not what I meant. I'm, I'm, I mean, like when you tell depressed people not to be depressed. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's like you can tell them just just don't be depressed, and it doesn't work. Yeah. And I can tell you yeah, just I mean. accept yourself, and you're like, I have no fucking idea how to do that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So let me tell you what accepting yourself looks like. Give me a second. Okay. Sure. Okay. So when you meet someone, you show them a mask. Right. Why do you show them a mask? Um, to be liked by the person, I would say. Be accepted by the person. Yeah. yeah, so so see this is this is the problem, right? So your solution is the problem. To be liked right. by them, to be accepted by them. And when they accept you, you fuck yourself because they're not actually accepting you. Who are they accepting? Mm. Well, yeah, my mask, basically. Yep. Yeah. And so all of your interactions reinforce the idea that the only thing about me that is that is worth loving is my mask. And so, like, the more people that accept your mask, what happens to your emotional loneliness? Well, it would get worse. Absolutely. The solution is the problem. So now let me ask you a question, Nicholas. Sure. How do we change that cycle? Well, in that case, um, it would be stopping, like, stopping yourself from putting a mask on. Um, sure. Which would, that's easier said than done. But yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, but it now would be hold basically on. To... Go ahead. Oh, I was I was gonna say basically um, not to enable yourself going that way and try to, you know, be yourself around more people. Almost. Yeah. So, but we've yeah. made so that's very different, right? Because telling the depressed person to not be depressed, in that case, the person doesn't know how to do it. They literally don't know how to do it. Right. But now we've come to a different problem. You know how to do it. It's just really hard. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, this apples and oranges, that make, though. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Right? So, like, like now I know this is going to sound weird, but this is how you accept yourself. When you show yourself to other people, you have to, that's, you have to accept yourself in that process. Does that make sense? You can't show yourself to someone yeah. without accepting who you are. Yeah, I, I can see that. Right. So like, I, I know it sounds weird, but that's how you do it. So what, what that means practically is I, I think that like, there are going to be times where you interact with other people, where there's going to be a part of you that says you're going to have a thought or you're going to want to do something or say something. And there's going to be a part of you that says, Nicholas, don't do that. Cause if you say that they'll run away. Do you know yeah. which part I'm talking yeah. about? Um, well, that would be the suppressed part of me, or like my actual. Thing. But I encourage you to look Almost. at your. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, um, I'm not sure how to phrase it. Uh, it would be the part of well, the my expect expectations of others inside of me, or my sure, fear. sure. Yeah, my point is I'm, that I'm not sure how to phrase it. The the um, mask has a cognitive component, right? So when we call right. a mask, you're not actually putting on a mask. What the mask is. Is it's a set of thoughts that dictate your behaviors. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the thing that if you want to accept yourself, 
What you have to do is notice those thoughts that are telling you to not say something and then choose the other thing. And they're going to say like, so you have a girlfriend now, it sounds like? No, no, no. No, no, no. Okay. Um, so, so, you know, like, are there certain things that we've talked about today, which you thought would be relevant, but you haven't shared because you're afraid of judgment? Mm, hold on. I'm trying to think about it. Um, only thing. No, no, not really. Okay. I have so like sent... yeah, no, just go on. Okay. Can, um, you gotta let me know if this is going overboard. Okay. But I'm just going to ask you sure. a question. Can we talk about why you don't have a girlfriend? Sure. Definitely. Okay. Now, my hope in talking about why you don't have a girlfriend is that you're going to have certain thoughts about yourself that the mask is going to want to cover or certain okay. feelings about yourself. Right. Do you think that that's the case if we talk about why you don't have a girlfriend? I think it, it could be the case, but not to the extent you might think. Okay. Um, so then give I mean, me but, something yeah. else. Um, the thing, the thing about this is that I've had it for a while, so I've kind of come to accept it as a part of me, if that makes sense, that I just do it, you know? Yep. Um, I understand. So that's why I, yeah, I want so, something that's like, you, you know, so let me put it this way. <laughs> you know, you said earlier that there are some things that you don't want to share with people because they're private. So like, let's pick one of those right. topics and talk about it. Um, well, this was one of the topics. It's not that I'm... Honestly, it's not because I'm afraid to talk about it. I just don't do it um, for the fact that I don't want to bother people with it. Okay, so what's Does something that, that you don't yeah. want to bother us with? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, this was one of them. The second would be um, my insecurity in myself sometimes, in my like the way I approach people, which uh, I feel like is a huge factor as, as to why I don't have a girlfriend as well. Um, also, my... Um, well, what was I going to say? Also, the fact that I get depressed, not diagnosed, which is like a huge, huge difference, but everyone gets depressed every now and mm -hmm. then, which happens quite a bit. Um, And all of that kind of contributes to me, you know, feeling it down a lot and I isolate myself. Um, And then, you know, I just end up getting those overloads I talked to you about. Nicholas, that. I want uh, you to show us an ugly part of you. I want to see an ugly part. I'm not part. sure how to show that, though. I'm not sure. What, <laughs> like, what's ugly? when you say that, um, I don't know. It's, it's hard for me to do. Like, uh, yep. when you say it, I don't know what to show, you know? Nothing really comes up, if that makes sense. <laughs> okay. So that's kind of interesting, yeah. right? So that, that leads to one of two. When I ask you to, I want to see the ugliest thing you've got. And that right. if, if you can't come up with something, what are the reasons that you may not be able to come up with it? Um, could be the mask, as you talked about. Uh, but um, the other thing I'm not sure about, honestly. Okay. Um, so I one is that you've gotten so used to suppressing it that you don't right. even know how to find it anymore. I have another wild, wild idea. Sure. What if you have nothing ugly within you and all you really have, much like the paranoid person, is a feeling that you're ugly? And yeah, that despite agree. you look for what's ugly within you, you can't find anything. Maybe what Maybe. you just have is the feeling of ugliness. Mm, yeah, I could agree to. Yeah, I could agree. Um, again, as I, as I mentioned at the start, uh, whenever I feel this loneliness, I don't know why. Um, and I think that's connected with this because I, I can't figure out any proper reason for me to not be lonely, but it happens anyway. Yep. You know? So, so I have a crazy idea. It's just a feeling. Right. It's not a truth. There's nothing broken. You're not ugly. Because I'm, I'm telling you, man, if you are ugly, like, that's cool. Show us so that we can either accept you or reject you. Right. And, right. and so I think this is also where acceptance comes in. I think you have to give people the, if you want, so, Nicholas, this all comes down to your sense of value. Somewhere along okay. the way, you started to believe that you weren't worth very much. That people treated right. you poorly because you weren't worth treating well. And like, that's why you put on the mask, because people can't see the ugliness on the inside.
So you have to put on a mask because what's down there is fundamentally ugly. And then you, you, you say this a lot. So like, you don't deserve a lot of friends. I don't want to bother people. If we think about those mm-hmm. two statements, what that means is that like, you're inconvenient, like you're not worth it. Like you're not worth inconveniencing someone else's day. It all comes down sure. to value. Yeah. Now here's the really tricky thing. As long as you keep a mask on, your sense of value will never increase. Because the more you wear the mask, the more what they judge is the mask and they don't judge you. And then you end up emotionally lonely because you never get to connect with someone because all they connect with is a false face that you put on. Yeah. So the way that you connect with people is by showing people. Now that's hard because I don't know that it's a particular thing and maybe we can find it. Maybe we can't. But even if we can't find it, what I think you need is courage. Because you have to you have to let them look underneath the mask and take the risk of being hurt again. Yeah. But the only right. the only way that you're gonna start to have faith in yourself and the only way you're gonna realize that you're not ugly on the inside is when you take off the mask, you go outside, and then like people treat you normally. And then the day that you start doing that, your life is gonna be entirely different. Because it's like, holy shit, I'm actually a pretty cool guy. People actually like me. They see me. They know me. And like, maybe the reason that those 14-year-olds blocked me is because they're fucking 14 and it's meow chat and the internet is a weird place. Maybe there's nothing fundamentally wrong with me. But you can't know that unless you give people a chance to reject you. Right now, the problem is that you're never... You're never putting anything on the table. Like you're never, you're not giving people a chance to know you. That's why you're lonely. Yeah. I think um, the hard part of it is to, to locate when exactly you put on the mask and then, you know, uh, rejecting it or putting it off. Sure. I I'm agree. Not sure, Cause yeah. Cause right now I've not really thought about putting the mask on more than what I explained to you earlier, that the fact that everyone puts masks on depending on the situation, right? But I've never thought about it the way you just put it. Um, so I don't think I know how or when it's there. Okay. If that makes sense. Sure. So Nicholas, let me ask you, do you have a mask on right now? Possibly. I'm not I'm not entirely aware of it, but I think I do. Yeah. Okay. So what from, is that from covering what you up? Told me, um that's something I can't quite locate. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. How does it, it feel? It's... How does it feel when I ask you these questions and you can't answer them? Uncomfortable and confusing. Good. So, Perfect. Yeah. We're getting underneath the mask. What <laughs> feels uncomfortable about it? Tell me about that discomfort. Um, I think the discomfort comes from the fact that I can't answer Good. Um, so when you can't answer yeah. a question that Dr. K is asking you, how does that make you feel? Well, yeah, uncomfortable. <laughs> okay. Un- it makes me uncomfortable, yeah. Okay, well, so there's... It, it, what's uncomfortable it's, about it? It's uncomfortable about it because I don't know why. Like, the the thing that I... Like, because I don't know it makes me uncomfortable because I thought that I kind of more or less knew why I had it. But this makes me a little bit uncomfortable because I can't figure out now... So when how I'm does how does someone who can't myself. figure something out when they're being asked feel? Uh, well, unknowledgeable or yep. stupid sometimes. I there guess. we yeah. go. So when yeah. you say uncomfortable, do you mean stupid? Mm, not entirely. When no. I mean uncomfortable, it's just when I think back to all the times I've interacted with people. When I I, I don't know when I've had the mask on then. It's yeah, but I'm, I'm talking about right now. Okay, so so okay, you don't know sure. when you've had the mask on. So I'm guessing, so generally speaking, when I ask people questions and they're not sure. able to answer them and they use the word uncomfortable, what I imagine they mean is that they feel dumb because they don't have the answers. No, that's not quite what I feel. What it's, do you it's, feel? It's just, uh, I wouldn't say stupid. I mean, I guess you could call it stupid, but not quite. Uh, it's, I feel more um, surprised. In like in a bad way, kind of like when you get a shock, right? Um, for the fact that I haven't known about this because I I feel like I know myself quite well. 
Um, mm. But apparently I don't. It, does that make sense? Yeah. So, so, so you feel like you should have figured this out. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you could say that. Yeah. So now that's interesting. So I think like that too comes from your sense of value. Right. So right. instead of just feeling stupid, oh, this is going to be hard, Nicholas. Okay. But I, I want to, I want you guys to really like pay attention to this. Instead of just feeling stupid, he's blaming himself for not figuring it out already. And that comes from the idea that you're fundamentally, you're not worth it, right? Like, oh God, this is so hard. I hope you guys understand this because I can't explain it better. Like the person who doesn't value themselves blames themselves for not knowing something when they learn something new. Do you guys get that? Like you guys see how that's his just, it's his, like instead of just feeling dumb like anyone else, he feels worthless because he couldn't figure it out. He should have figured it out long ago. Look at how dumb I am. Like, look at how worthless I am. Other people would have okay. been able to figure it out, but I can't figure it out. You guys see that? It's all, it's all like spiraling out of this sense of lack of worth. Does that make sense to you, Nicholas? That makes sense. You're yeah, like blaming yourself for not having figured this out. Is that fair? Yeah. It's not that no, you it's feel- No, it's not fair. It's not fair. Yeah, but I, yeah. Is it accurate? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's fair. It's accurate, yeah. Yeah. Right. So, but do you see how, like, I'm just asking you a question and then what your mind is doing is you're saying, oh, I can't believe that I didn't notice this before. Like, how dumb yes. am I? That, that, that is the um, feeling of was trying to Yeah. Right. I so like that, that too is a feeling of value. It's about a feeling of your identity as a person. It's not like I'm dumb because I have low IQ. It's like, I should have figured this out. Like you're beating yourself up. Right. So now I'm going to ask you a different question, Nicholas. Here you are being an idiot in front of us and revealing all of the things that you should have figured out on your own. And how do you feel? Um, I feel nervous, honestly. And Good. I feel, mm, I feel like I should have done this a long time ago with friends, honestly. That, that's the, that's the two main feelings. Okay. So, me, so like, let's, yeah. there it is again. Okay. So now I'm going to ask you, I should have done this a long time ago with friends. Tell me about that. Um, if I, if I, I feel like if I've done it with friends before, maybe the problem wouldn't have been as profound as it, as it is. And right so now. whose, whose fault is it that the problem is this bad? <laughs> in that sense, I would say it, it would have been my own fault. In the there you go. Sense. You yeah. see how your mind does that? Yeah. Your mind jumps to blame you. No matter, like, that. however yeah. I twist and turn, oh, it's like, oh, I should, like, you see, do you really get what I'm saying here? Yeah, I can see now what you mean. I think I do that quite a lot. Yeah, your mind jumps yeah. to this idea that it's your fault. And why is it your fault? Because your sense of value for yourself is low. It can't be someone else's fault, Nicholas. When they stopped, when they blocked you, whose fault was it, Nick? My fault. There it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see I see. Oh, so, man. what do you see? Tell me. I see why, um, you know, these feelings kind of come up now if I'm constantly putting myself under the bus, basically. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> you know, that makes sense. <laughs> right? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It's weird, man. But so here's the thing. I hope that you have some some kind of hope at this point. Because I certainly have hope for you. Sure. Yeah. I mean... I don't feel so. Here's the thing: I don't feel hopeless. Um, yeah. Because I've felt progress, and then I've you know kind of like taken two steps forward, and then went back, kind of back and forth. Um, what really gets to me is when I have you know um, those episodes of overload, because that then it, it kind of affects me for like days at a time. But okay. I feel a numb. Yeah. So like, um, let's say I get it, and then I'm I'm feeling extra lonely and anxious for like three hours, maybe. Um, and then I, w then I will feel numb for like two days, three days. Okay. And that's, that's what really like makes me feel lonely after that point. Now what I'm not like everything else you say still counts, but this is what like really hits me. That's what I was hoping to, to kind of talk about. Yeah. So uh, I know this is going to sound maybe a little bit disappointing, Nicholas, but I don't think you can do so much about those overload states right now. Sure. I think the overload states will get better over time. The more that you notice and accept 
that there is a part of you that is going to twist and turn and blame yourself. And my guess sure. is that if you tunnel into those overloaded states or right, right before you get overloaded, if you tunnel down into what you're thinking, somehow it's a thought that stems from your sense that like you messed up in some way or that you're not a good person. I could it's, agree. Yeah. It's like a frenzy of like thoughts about, oh, I messed this up or I should have done this or like, you know, this person, like I could have done this better. And, and like, it's something about you not and, and all of those shoulds that you tell yourself, those are not acceptance. Because like, even then, like if yeah. you say, oh, I should have done this with friends, like you can't accept that, like, it's okay to not have done it with friends. Like you're doing it now. Like it, like, do you see how should and acceptance are at opposite ends of the spectrum? Like yeah. this pen is black. Yeah. It should be blue. Like that's not accepting that the pen is black. It's just two opposite ends. And, and so the cool thing is that I think that you, you will get better, but the, the solution to the overload episodes is not to fix the episode. It's to slowly chip away at the fuel for the episode. Right. Right. So, sense. and yeah. and the more that you look at like how your mind makes it your fault, is your mind making it your fault here? When you're listening to me, is it doing something? No, I'm just, I'm just listening. Okay. I'm thinking about when I have the episodes that um, usually something triggers it, right? So I've done something, but as you said, where I feel like I was in the wrong. Yep, and there it is. Files into there, there, there. No, okay. <laughs> yeah, right. You could tell me yeah, more. Yeah. But do you see you see how like what triggers the episode is the idea that you've done something wrong. And what's fucked up is you probably didn't even do anything wrong. And so right. what I'm saying is if you want to conquer the episode, so I want everyone to understand this. People come to me and they say, How do I put out the fire? My house is burning down. Every week it burns down. And what I say is, don't try to put out the fire, put out the match. Put out the match that gets you started. And like, because people yeah. look at this and it's kind of bizarre, but like, it's way easier to put out a match than it is to put out the fire once it's started. And so once you get into that overload mode, it's going to take a lot of effort, a lot of work to kind of wrap that in. But what I'm telling you, and this is when, when I think about, you know, when I've helped people who have like panic attacks and stuff to the point where they, they're like off of medication they're basically, I mean, they're not really cured, but in psychiatry, we don't cure anyone. We have something called sustained remission, which means that they don't have any symptoms for a long period of time, but we don't cure anyone because we don't, we can't right. do that. Fine. So when I see patients with sustained remission, the way that I get there is I, I get them to put out the match. You go to the root of it and you pull out the root and all of the subsequent behaviors will come crumbling down. So would you say, um, would you say the way to find the match would just to be recognized in it when it happens? Or Absolutely. What, would you, because you said uh, it gets triggered by what, Nicholas? Um, by me blaming myself. Basically. There it is. Yeah. So the the hard part at that point, I would say, is just to to stop the thoughts from rolling in. Nope, you can't stop them. Nope, that's better. not acceptance. Right. See, that's what you try fair, to do. Okay, I would bet fair, money. Fair yeah. I would bet money that you fight against them. You fight against them with every fiber of your being. And the more you fight yeah. them, the more they grow. That's right. Right? So I want you to imagine mm -hmm. this. I want you guys to think about your thoughts like water. And the harder you hit it, like if I if I jump off of a hundred foot diving board and I make myself flat and I smack into water, it's hard like concrete. The harder I push against it, the harder it pushes back. If I'm in a bathtub, or if I'm in the ocean, let's say a bathtub, if I'm in the bathtub and there are too many waves in the bathtub, and I push against the waves, what happens? Well, they push back. Absolutely. Right. And so that's what you do. When those thoughts come, what do you do, Nicholas? I push back. And then what, they, what do they do? Well, they push back harder. So. Then what do you do? Yeah, push back. Yeah, back and forth. You know. And then you hit yeah. overload. Right. You see that? It's an escalating cycle until you're like, you're tired of pushing back. You're physically exhausted. You just lay back. They hammer you for a while and then they stop.
And then you crawl out of the tub and you're numb for two or three days because you're exhausted from all this cognitive activity. So acceptance is laying back at the very beginning. Okay. Stopping the cycle. So when they hammer you, you just notice it and say, oh, here it is again. Here's my old friend. Here's 14-year-old Nicholas who's paranoid that the world doesn't like him. Because that yeah. Nicholas is still 14. It's not the person that you are today. With your cool hair and your beard. Yeah, right? there's, four, there's 14 year old Nicholas who's not confident, who's insecure. And sometimes he's afraid and he comes and he says, Nick, I'm, I'm afraid that people aren't going to like me. And then you're like, fuck you. Everyone likes you, you piece of shit. Why are you complaining? And then he grows. He gets stronger. Every time you push him away, he gets stronger. So when those spirals start, see that within yourself. See that there's like this part of you that's like, oh my God, these people don't like me. I screwed something up. And instead of saying, no, 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 you didn't screw anything up. You're great, bro. You're awesome. Because that's actually what the abuse of 14-year-old Nicholas looks like. That's the positive fucking mental attitude that your therapist taught you. Right? It's telling you, like, no, man, like, you're awesome. Like, everyone likes you. You have no reason to feel that way. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds bizarre, but that positivity is abusive. It's the weirdest thing in the world. So you would say it's basically enabling yourself. At that Absolutely. Point. And that's yeah. what we hear from you, right? We hear that everything you do makes it worse. <laughs> so stop yeah. doing yeah, those that's things, true. Man. That's definitely true. Right? Yeah. And it started with yeah. this positive mental attitude stuff because the positive mental attitude was useful for a time. It worked for a time, right? It helped you make friends and stuff. But now you're finding like, okay, I can't make authentic friends. Definitely. And definitely. so I, I, I think that there are times where you interact with other people where you want to say something that's authentic and then your mind tells you you're going to screw it up if you tell them. Yeah. And definitely. then you don't speak. And instead, what you need to do is speak. And here's the wild thing. I'm not going to tell you you won't screw it up. The way to overcome this is by screwing it up over and over and over again. Because you're not going to screw it up all the time. You're going to screw it up sometimes. And you're not going to screw it up other times. And that's when you're going to find like the middle road of like who you are. That you're not perfect because that's what you try to be, by the way. I don't know if you noticed. Sure. Like the yeah, more you try sometimes. to be perfect the more that comes from the idea that you don't have inherent value. Like the less, the more insecure you are in yourself as a person, the harder you try to be perfect. And instead what you need to be is just be who you are, which is like a 20 year old guy who's like got some problems with self-confidence, but is also like kind of friendly and charismatic and knows how to talk to people. Sure. Be that yeah. dude. Be the guy who like pisses some people off and, Befriends others. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can agree. The thing, it's hard though, right? It's, it's, it's hard absolutely to, hard. To not push back. Yep. That's the, that's the main thing. Yep. Um, so now, Nicholas, we're going to test you. You ready for a test? <laughs> sure. Okay. okay. Hit me. If I tell you to push back and you can't I... push back, how do you think about yourself? Uh, wait, um, can you rephrase that? Yeah, so you say it's hard. So let's say you right. try and you fail. How do you sure. think about yourself after you fail? Uh, I would feel disappointed normally. Yep. Right. And then you would say to yourself, I should be able to do it. Yeah. Correct. And there it is again. Do you see it? Same thing. The fact, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I see what you mean. But right. So, yeah. So, so the next I time, you, yeah. So, so the next time yeah. you try and it's hard and you fail, what are you going to tell yourself instead? That's okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And what is it okay? Yeah. It's it's okay to fail. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. It's okay so, to to not be perfect. Yep. Okay. And and what do we call that, by the way? Acceptance. There you go. 
Yeah. That's, That's how cool. you accept yourself. <laughs> you see, you figured it out. Yeah, now I just have to put it into practice. <laughs> yeah, you know. well, and, and what happens when you try and you fail? Then I should be okay with it and accept it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Because <laughs> even then, when you yeah. say, now I need to put it into practice, what you're doing is you're, you're devaluing the success of understanding you just had. Okay. That's interesting. Because I didn't notice that. Yep. Because you don't. Because it's yeah. there, man. It's there in your programming. Right? Because when you say, now yeah. I need to put it into practice, what that says is Nicholas isn't good enough. Okay. You... That's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Because I, I would say I saw it differently. But uh -huh. yeah, when I said it firstly it was more like a hopeful statement sure but i can see what you mean by it yeah yeah yep yeah. and i'm not i'm not disputing so i think the other tricky thing is that i think hope can be within this thing right i i think you can because if you're different you can hope right it's it's subtle yeah. but you're like if i was a different person if i behaved like i should i'm hopeful for the future okay if i dot 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 yeah. then i can hope but the still subtle thing there is that, Nicholas, you don't need to do anything, man. You're perfect just the way that you are. Yeah, perfection and imperfection is what you mean. Right? Yep. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's hard, man. <laughs> that's yes, tough. that's good. That's, tough. that's progress. Because let me explain something to you. When you say that's hard, man... There's no should there. There's no hope. That is a statement of acceptance. Okay. Right? That is a statement that says, yeah. I don't know if I can do it. It's not beating yourself yeah. up for not being able to do it. It's not saying that you should be able to do it. It's saying, you know what, man? That's hard. That's acceptance. Yeah. Yeah. I can see. I see. Yeah, I have to. I, I, I'm trying to wrap my uh, mind around. This. Yeah, sorry. It's it's kind of it's getting abstract. Yeah. But I, I Nicholas, really, I I think it's like there are a couple of core things where I really think if you can kind of really get a handle on them and learn how to see them, and learn how to say that's hard. Right. Like so. Like right. there's 14 year old Nicholas and there's 20 year old Nicholas. And when 14 year old Nicholas comes to 20 year old Nicholas and he says, "Hey, my friends block blocked me on Meow Chat." And then when Nicholas says, hey, man, that's rough. That's hard. That's got to be tough. That's acceptance, yeah. right? It's not telling him, hey, you're a piece of shit. It's also not telling him that you're a wonderful person. You didn't do anything wrong. Maybe you did. Either way, you can accept that it's hard, that it's tough. And it doesn't have to mean anything more beyond that. Okay. Questions? Yeah. Mm, I'm trying to think of some... Mm. Right. So what would you do? Um, I, I guess this kind of answered. I'm, I'm trying to unfold it a bit more. Sure. So what would you do when some someone um, does something rather mean, but you can't figure out the reasoning for it? In this case being, uh, so what, I, I used to live in Spain. <clears throat> um, in Spain, what happened, I went to a party and at the party, someone um, literally punched me like without any reason. I, I figured out the reason later being that she was trying to get some money off of someone um you know by doing some work <laughs> okay, she would say i don't know if i can say it on stream i don't know if I'm you can either can make... i mean there's against terms uh, <laughs> yeah um it was you know some illegal kind of work she was trying to do with someone okay um and she felt like kind of blocked that off so she punched me um but i i didn't know that until later so i beat myself up for that because i couldn't figure out why i was punched right um so in that in that sense what would you what would you do like because i'm not sure how you would accept that thing as except what it's just that that you know except that someone punched you without reasoning how, how would you not overthink it is what i'm trying to say because i instantly you know tried to as we you know talked about tried to find a reason for it yep so I think, yeah. Nicholas, that's a great example, man, because that example shows, and I say this with love, how fucked up your reasoning is. 
Because when you're at a party <laughs> and, and you get randomly punched by someone, if your mind somehow does some gymnastics to make it your fault, when you don't even know who this person is and she just walks up to you and punches you, like, do you see how that's just absolutely ridiculous? Like, the reason she punched you is yeah. because she's an asshole. That's the reason. Right. It has nothing to do with you. <laughs> Definitely. But I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, how would you... Because I feel like most people would think about that to an extreme, right? Absolutely. Because it's such a random thing that would occur. So how would you stop yourself? Um, well, not stop yourself, but how would you not beat yourself up from it is what I'm trying to ask. Okay, so, I mean, I think... Oddly enough, I know this sounds bizarre, Nicholas. I don't think most people would beat themselves up after getting punched punched randomly in the face. <laughs> sure enough. Okay. Sure enough. Okay. Uh, but I, I think, but that doesn't help you because you beat yourself up. And that should just give us sure. an idea for how strong that complex is in your mind. So here's yeah. a here's an answer for you. So I want you, and this is gonna sound kind of weird, but maybe it'll help because it's sort of a long shot. So I want you to think about karma. Karma. What's your understanding sure. of karma? Um, I have the understanding that karma is necessarily good or bad, but it's a bunch of energy that kind of determines where you go in the next life. Okay. If I'm so, understanding it correctly. Yep. So I'm going to yeah. tell you a story. So you, you've heard of this guy, Buddha, Buddha? Yeah. Siddhartha Gautam Buddha. Okay. So Buddha yeah. gets enlightened. Okay. And then he like, he's like teaching people. And so he's got a bunch of disciples and he's like sort of famous at this point. And one day, someone comes up to him. So he's like teaching and now he like gives a lecture. And after the lecture, you know, he's got his disciples that are there. And then someone comes up and sometimes people will come up and ask him questions. And so someone comes up to him and, and he says, hey, do you remember me? And Buddha says, no, I don't. And he says, well, you tried to teach me how to meditate 15 years ago and it didn't work. And then the dude spits in Buddha's face. He's like, fuck you. And then his disciples okay. get pissed. They're like, this guy's like, he's disrespecting the master. Like, let's beat his ass. And then Buddha's like, no, 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 calm down. Chill. And he's like, just let him go. So the dude like spits in his face and he like walks away. He's like expecting something to happen. And he walks away. And they're like, how can you let this guy disrespect you like that? And Buddha's like, that's just a karma that he has to wipe away. So he has like some amount of resentment. I may have wronged him. He spit in my face and now we're done. He's gone. He's going to go live his life. I'm going to go live mine. It's just sort of like, it just gets wiped away. Just because I'm enlightened doesn't mean that I've become free of all of my past karmas. It's just a debt that I had to pay. Okay. So I don't know if this is going to help you or not. But I would say that, you know, if you're trying to think about why bad things happen to you and you're looking for an alternate solution besides I'm an idiot and it's my fault and I lack value. I would toss out karma for you to think about. Now, you have to decide for yourself whether, like, after studying it and thinking about it, it's a good alternate solution. But in my mind, you know, all causes have effects and all effects have causes. So one way to sure. think about it is, like, you're looking for, you know, the cause to the effect of her punching you, whereas, like, that cause may not come from you. And in fact, her punching you may not be an effect. It could be a cause. She could be opening up a new karma where like yeah. you had the opportunity to punch her back. Right. I, anyway, it gets complicated. But I, I mean, the, the simplest answer I can give you is like, just understand that some of the shit that happens to you in life is like, you could say, if you don't want to think about karma, you could just say, hey, man, shit happens. Some people say that, right? Some people say that the world is a random place and sometimes just random bad things happen to good people, like, which is a completely reasonable hypothesis. On the other hand, some people say that everything is determined and orderly and like it's because God wants it to happen and stuff like that. I think that's a completely fine hypothesis too. In the middle, I think there's just the simple principle of cause and effect, which is karma, which is that like things have, like all things have causes and all causes have effects. And that doesn't sure. mean that you're the creator of the universe and sometimes people are going to be assholes to you because that's just karma. You know, why is one person yeah. born in the United States whereas another person is born in Zimbabwe whereas another person is born in, in Australia? You can say it's randomness. You can say it's karma. But in your case, I'd say just think about like, you know, are you the center of all things that happen to you? 
Um, in my world, technically, yes. <laughs> you know, because you, yeah, you perceive everything. Right. So everything. that's something that I would yeah. encourage you to think about, right? So I don't doubt that you perceive it. And you may even ar arrive at a logical truth that you are the center of all things that happen to you. But I'd encourage you to think about it. Be like, sure. is it my fault if I'm walking down the street and someone, you know, spills their drink on me? Did I do something wrong? And I'm not sure. I need you. I think you need to okay. give your life actors besides yourself. Yeah, I could agree. Yeah. Right. Because sometimes when people block you, it's because they're envious. Not because you did something wrong, but because they're envious. All kinds of reasons people block other people. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's not the fact that, that they block me. It's more like the way that they just, you know, cut off the relations. Sure. You know? Yeah. It's, yeah. Because people get blocked all the time, but yep. it's more like the, yeah. Yeah. And so once again, there are lots of reasons that could happen. I think the problem is that your mind jumps to one. And the more that you notice, okay, here my mind is blaming me again. And even in that scenario, if you notice that your mind is blaming you for being punched by a random person at a party, then just be like, whoa, that's kind of weird. Like, there it is again, blaming me for being punched by a random person. True. Yeah. And I, I think I know, that's something. Oh, go on. I, I was going to say, like, I, I don't even think you need to do much more than that. If you can just right. notice that that's the part of the mind, I, I kid you not, it it starts to get better. I know it's bizarre. Well, yeah, def it's definitely worth a try. So, you know, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that's I wild, man. That she just punched you. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, no, I was <laughs> so we were sitting um, like in a circle, and I was talking to my friend. He was sitting across from me, and she was sitting in the middle, and then. Um, to put it frank, she felt that I was cock blocking her because she was trying to charge him for it. And then she punched me. Um, and then we left. But I, I didn't find that out until like a few days later. So Sounds like you helped your friend yeah. out. Yeah. I mean he's he also just found it out later. <laughs> so you know. But it is it is what it is. So. Yeah, that's yeah. a wild story, man. Yeah, I mean, that's um, one of the good things you do when you travel around, right? Huh? You get to experience stuff. I said that's one of the good things about traveling, is that you yeah. get to experience wild stories. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay, so Not we've got a least. choice then, Nicholas. Um, I feel like we've covered, a, a like, you know, we've kind of gotten to, like, an important conclusion. If you want to open up something else, we can, or we can kind of switch to meditation. What do you think? Uh, I don't really have anything to open. So okay. can meditate. Yeah. Um, the one thought that you'd made one statement, which I don't think we had really addressed. One was that independence leads to like a lack of uh, disclosing or sharing with other people. Like you said something about right. in being independent yeah. and that's why you don't want to share. Yeah, I have this feeling um, of self-reliance, right? So I want to be very independent in pretty much everything I do. Um, which is also, you know, with conflicting with my own feelings and stuff like that. So I usually don't tend to, to reach out to people unless I know for sure I can't do it myself. Um, which is kind of contradicting with, you know, this whole thing, because, you know, but that's how it is practically, not necessarily. No, I don't, I, I, don't, yeah. I don't think it's contradictory at all. I think that if you, okay. if you have low value in yourself, you can strive for independence because if you can do it all by yourself, then you don't have to worry about it. Sort of negates the low value. It negates right. being, yeah. you know, relying on other people. I, I think it makes a lot of sense. But I okay. Um. So let's talk about meditation. Sure. Have you had experience with meditation? Uh, a little bit because um, I used to meditate like before going to bed, just like sitting down and relaxing for a bit but not like too much. Okay. So I just, I did like five minutes just sitting, closing my eyes and listening. That's it. Five, 10 minutes. Okay. Let me think about what to do. Sure. 
I have a meditation technique for you, but it's a little bit advanced, so it could be hard. Um, but I, mean, I, I want to teach something a little bit different. Okay. Let me just think about how to explain it, okay? Okay. So, I want to teach you something, Nicholas, that involves understanding your relationship to the outside world. Okay. Okay. So if we think about like this punching example, something in the outside world happens and you somehow think it has something to do with you. Does right. that make sense? Like, I know it yeah. sounds really bizarre, but like as human beings, we assume that we interact with the world in a particular way, that we're responsible for some things. Right. So in a weird way, it's almost like we believe subconsciously that we control the world. I know it sounds weird, but like, let me yeah. give you an example. Let's say that I apply for a job or I ask a girl out and I get rejected. I blame myself. It's my fault that I didn't get the job. I should have studied harder. I should have done a better internship. I should have wrote a, a, a bigger personal statement, whatever. And we don't really acknowledge that the outside world has all kinds of reasons for treating us the way that it does, which have nothing to do with us. Like maybe the reason that I didn't get the job is because, you know, it was a job. Maybe the company is actually going out of business. And then they I interviewed people and then like never hired it. Right. But that's not the way that we think about it. We always assume that we are responsible for the things that happen to us. Does that right. make sense? Yeah. So I, yeah. I know it sounds weird, but I want to teach you a way where you can start discovering what the actual relationship between you and the outside world is. Where does Nicholas end and the outside world begin? Okay. Okay, I know it sounds weird. Yeah, So no, let's give it a try. Um, the, the practice is actually quite simple, <laughs> but it's hard. Okay, so what I, I, I have to figure out how am I, I need music. Okay, so um, what I want you to do is tune into the stream. Okay. So you can hear the background music. Can you hear the music? Yeah, I hear the music. Okay, so this is what I want you to do. So I want all you guys to close your eyes and listen to the music. So hear the notes in the music. Nicholas? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear it. Okay. So when you listen to my words or the music, I don't know how to put this, but your attention is focused on my words, right? It's focused mm -hmm. on something outside. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you're listening to the notes of the music. Sure. Okay. So now what I want you to do is put your attention on your ears and put your attention okay. not physically on your ears but on the sense of hearing okay so don't listen to the notes pay attention to you hearing them so it used to be that your attention was on the notes now your attention is on you hearing the notes mm -hmm. can you do that I think so, yeah. Try. Now you may find that your attention goes back to the notes after a few moments. Mm -hmm. Does that happen? A little bit. Okay, and then when it moves back to the notes, shift it back to the hearing of the notes. So put all your attention on your hearing as opposed to the music.
How long can you hold on to the hearing instead of the notes? I think maybe um, half a minute to 45 seconds at a time. Okay. Before so, I turn back and forth. Okay. So just, we're going to practice for about another minute, okay? Okay. Continue to talk. Do your best not to pay attention to my words, but listen or pay attention to your hearing of the words without paying attention to the words. It can be difficult. Mm -hmm. Now go ahead and come back. Okay. Go back to camera. Sure. Okay. Okay. So now what I'm going to ask you to do is look at me. Sure. So see my face. So we're going to do the same thing, but this time we're going to use our eyes. Okay. So look okay. at my face. And so see it, right? You can look at the background. Mm -hmm. You can pay, put your attention on anything on your screen. Or actually, yeah, or you can look at something in your room. It doesn't really matter. Okay. Then what I want you to do is put your attention to the looking. Instead of looking at something, having your attention on the objects that your eyes see, have your attention be on the looking itself. So it'll okay. almost feel, it feels to me like zooming out. And then yeah, I'm kind like of, a blurry vision kind of. Yeah, it's vision. not quite blurry vision, but then you're doing it right, right? So just pay attention to the seeing itself as opposed to the object of seeing. And you can look at something like an object in your room or the screen. And then focus on the object, like let your eyes look at the object and really see the object, and then let your attention pull back and see the seeing itself. Mm -hmm. We'll go for about a minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thoughts, questions? Do you want to share what that was like for you? I felt um I felt like sort of calmness because I, I didn't feel like I was thinking about stuff, you know? Good. So I, ju I just felt uh observing. I guess you could call it. 
just do, by seeing stuff. Yeah. Do, do that yeah. make sense where you're seeing the seeing itself as opposed to seeing an object? Yeah, definitely. Okay. I, I feel like that, that's doable. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. so, so I, I don't know how else to put this, but so here's the cool thing about this practice. Okay. Mm -hmm. When we see an object, it is outside of us, right? Like, so let's say here's me, here's the object. If I'm looking at it, then the object is out here, and therefore me and the object are separate. Does that make right. sense? Yeah. So like, I'm over here, seeing is over here, the object is over here. When you look at the seeing, what happens is the seeing moves from you to the outside. And then you're looking at the seeing itself. So there's almost a piece of you. There's a piece of who you think you are that you shift outside of yourself by looking at the seeing. Because then the seeing is yeah. out there and you're looking at it and then you're over here. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 As, as you said, it kind of feels like um, zooming out for me, it's more like a bit of a blurriness. I guess you could say, um, but it definitely feels like you're not like focusing on one thing, yep. except for like, you know. But, so, so, so this is tricky, right? So um, after the zooming out, there is actually the focusing on the thing that is doing the zooming out. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it's noticing the seeing itself, which has the effect on the object side of zooming out. But what I really want you to focus on is the act of seeing. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. Okay. That and, that is, um, no, yeah, go on. No, go you go for it. I, I was just gonna say that is, I mean, it's doable, but I don't, I can't do it for like long periods of time. Good. Yeah, I mean, it's very hard. So here's the crate. I know this is gonna sound wild, but your problem, Nicholas, is that you confuse what's in here with what's in the outside world. This person ghosted yep. me. That's not on the outside. That's on the inside. This woman punched me. That's not on the outside. That's on the inside. And that's the fucked up thing that we've showed you today. And so yep. literally, if you do this practice, you will learn how to like, like get control over what is on the inside and what is on the outside. Instead of misattributing everything, you will begin to see on a very fundamental level what you are and what the outside world is and what you control and what you can't control. This all comes down to uh, earlier, you tossed out this tiny, tiny quip where I don't know what to show people because I don't know who I am. Gotcha. Yeah. And this will be a practice where you can learn, are you seeing? Are you the object that you see? Are you the seeing itself or are you something else? And if you continue to do this, I really think it'll help you along with the noticing and acceptance and all that other crap we talked about. It's like literally a cognitive training skill to like do something different with your mind. You can practice it. And then when it comes to dealing with your, your view of like your confidence in yourself or your value as a person, you'll have done a bunch of push-ups. So when it comes time to actually use your mind, it'll like work way better. It'll make everything way easier for you. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool, man. Any last thoughts or questions? No, um, I, I think we're good to go. Okay, honestly. listen, uh, Nick, it's been awesome having you, man. I really, really um, appreciated what you shared with us. I think it's very, very important. Like, there are a couple of key principles here that I think are really, really important. So, thank you so much for. Um, you know, coming on. I'm going to take a moment to collect my thoughts and then I'll try to recap for other people. You're welcome to watch the stream. Sure. Is sure. that okay? Of course. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you for having me. It was thank you time. for coming, man. It's been awesome. Take care. No worries. You too, man. Bye now. Bye.